In 2009, when I came to Vancouver, uh, Mike Barnett, who was the, uh, the head of hematology at the time, uh, introduced me to these two um, remarkable um, hematologists, um, Linda Vickers and Sheldon Neyman, who have sadly um, uh, died since. Uh, Michelle Neyman was a hematologist who came from Toronto and trained in Los Angeles and um, then came to um, Vancouver, where he really established the first bone marrow transplant program and really was a force. In, in general hematology, in teaching and training, um, and um, um, ended up his career in uh, teaching uh, primarily um, hemostasis thrombosis and morphology to everybody really in the hematology community. Um, and I think any faculty here was touched by, um, by Shelley. Um, and then uh, Linda Vickers, a little younger, um, but um, she, when, when she came, I immediately um, invited her to be on the steering committee for the uh, Center for Blood Research, where she played a very active role. She was at that time the, uh, the head of the um, uh, provincial um, hemoglobinopathy and bleeding disorders clinic at St. Paul's Hospital and, and really um, was the adult arm of bleeding disorders in the province um, and uh, laid a, a foundation for um, growth of that program. Um, so their, their mandate from their perspective really was to um, provide a major academic um, center in the, in the field of benign hematology and in um, teaching and training and they were really devoted. And they left half of their estate when they died to, um, the, um, to, to that end to develop um, better programs in benign hematology, uh, particularly at UBC. Um, and I've had the honor of, of um, supervising a steer or leading a se steering committee to that end. And as a result, we've had a huge impact on undergraduate students, so over 100 undergraduate students for summer student programs, graduate students or 40 to 50 who are partially supported, and a variety of other programs um, that have promoted benign hematology. One of their wishes um, was to establish a professorship, um, which we have done, and I'm really pleased um, um, to announce um, that Jose Lopez is uh, this year's um, uh, Sheldon Neyman, Linda Vickers, visiting professor in benign hematology, and I can't think of a better choice. Um, Jose is is a longtime friend of the Center for Blood Research. I think he's been coming. Well, he's been coming here since since I've been here, and then before, as a matter of fact, because I think he was on a, a an evaluation committee for um, the center when it was first established. Jose trained in um, um, in medicine at the University of Albert, uh, University of Mexico, um, uh, University of New Mexico. Is that right? Um, in Albuquerque, and then um, moved to um, Seattle to the University of Washington, where really he has been there since doing internal medicine, hematology um, for the fellowships in biochemistry, and has established his own lab that's been there for a long time. Um, and he's really a leading force in hematology. He's um, um, he rose through the ranks rapidly to become a professor of medicine and hematology. Uh, he is um, on and off uh, um, chief scientific officer of and CEO of uh, Puget Sound, which is um, Blood Center, which is renamed to the Blood um, Center Northwest, Blood Works Northwest. Um, he is an associate editor of Blood for I don't know how many years, long time. Um, and, um, and he's a mentor to young investigators. Everywhere I go, I find out, oh, Jose's helping me on this, and Jose's advising me on this. And he really is. He's fantastic. And he's been always involved in a variety of, of other programs. He's always here um, asking questions, which is um, his role. That's the only reason I invite him up, actually, because I know that he'll ask questions and keep, keep things rolling. So, Jose, I'm pleased and honored to have you give this presentation. Thank you, Ed. Uh, I can't say how much of an honor this is, both because the symposium is in honor of my postdoc mentor, Dr. Earl Davey, who um, just died two years ago, and uh, we miss him a lot already. And it's been my privilege to be able to learn um, something about the lives and careers of Dr. Uh, Naiman and Vickers, and um, it's humbling to be able to be up here and, um, and honor them because um, 
I, they kind of did everything that I aspire to do, and that is to, um, to teach, uh, to investigate, and to help the next generations of investigators uh, progress. So uh, thank you for the invitation. It's just fantastic. OK, so today I'm going to talk about uh, work that we've been doing really already for over two decades. Uh, and that is on this protein called von Willebrand factor, which is the blood's biggest protein. Normally, we think about von Willebrand factor as a protein that uh, mediates the attachment of platelets to the vessel wall when the vessel wall gets injured. But 20 years ago, uh, my colleague and I, Jing, uh, my colleague Jingfei Dong and I were doing experiments where we were investigating the interactions of platelets with activated endothelium. If we took platelet-rich plasma and we perfused it over the endothelium, um, we would get single platelets attaching, and that seemed to be a P-selectin-dependent event. But uh, one day, he decided to use washed platelets for some reason, which I didn't understand. And we observed these long strings of platelets seemingly attached to something underneath. And these strings were really incredibly long, longer than any single molecule could possibly be in the plasma, and longer than the biggest, most giant multimers of von Willebrand factor. So we hypothesized that, oh, I went the wrong way, uh, that what we were seeing is something like this, that the endothelium cell, endothelial cells were being activated, they were releasing von Willebrand factor, and that von Willebrand factor was attaching to itself. It was self-associating, and it was directing these strands to be formed in the direction of the blood flow, and then the platelets were attaching to them. Uh, so that, uh, that was the first time, really, that anybody described that von Willebrand factor doesn't just get secreted like a normal secreted protein, but there's a fraction of it that remains attached to the endothelial surface. And that, the reason we didn't see these before is because the uh, AdamTS13 enzyme, the VWF cleaving enzyme, is very efficient at removing these from the endothelium. So here's an experiment <clears throat> that we did uh, about a decade ago with... Uh, Ying Zheng in, uh, at the University of Washington in these endothelial, endothelialized uh, in vitro microvessels. And they're activated, and the platelets are perfused over them. And what you see in the back here are these strands of, of von Willebrand factor that you can tell they're, that thicker strands are composed of minor strands, and sometimes they uh, diverge, sometimes they converge. And here you see that they have attached to them a series of platelets. And these are always oriented in the direction of blood flow. Here's a vessel from the same set of experiments, which is a pretty big vessel. This vessel is about 500 angstroms in diameter. And you can see that uh, after activation, and, and no blood has gone through it, just buffer. You can see these strands of von Willebrand factor, and they go just where the blood flow would go. They tend to accumulate on the inner corners of curves, as you see here and uh, be relatively uh, uh, depleted in places where there's not a lot of blood flow. Here's another curve over here, and you can see that that's where the vessels go. So this is a big vessel, and here is a smaller vessel. These vessels are about 200 uh, microns across. And in this case, we have activated and perfused buffer again, and you can see that there's a strand of VWF that goes through that vessel in the shortest distance that fluid could travel. And it goes on and on and on. We measured one that was five centimeters long. So a continuous strand of von Willebrand factor made up of all of this von Willebrand factor that's secreted by the endothelium and self-associates. And this type of von Willebrand factor is very efficient in capturing platelets. What promotes the formation of these strands is um, shear stress and flow acceleration. So essentially what you have to do is you have to put a force on the individual strands of von Willebrand factor that unfold internal domains, and some of those internal domains can self-associate. At least that's our current working hypothesis. Here we have an, uh, in, uh, a vessel where you have a bigger diameter going into a smaller diameter. When that happens, of course, to maintain bulk flow, there has to be acceleration of the flow. Uh, the flow uh, down uh, to, the, to the right side is going much faster than the flow uh, in, in the left side. 
And so uh, it has to accelerate in that region where you see that the, that the whole vessel is plastered with a layer of self-associated von Willebrand factor. So is there something that regulates this phenomenon? We, and uh, why I ask this is because we noticed that if, we, if you keep plasma in a tube, uh, pretty much you can maintain the von Willebrand factor in that tube for a long time. If you purify the VWF to a certain level of purity, uh, within a few days, it's completely lost. And where it's lost to is it goes onto the tube wall and then it self-associates with itself. But something in plasma mean, uh, prevents that. And uh, that something is even in boiled plasma, so the supernatant of boiled plasma. And what we discovered was, and we published this in 2016, that a high-density lipoprotein, or the cardioprotective lipoprotein, um, was the factor in plasma that prevented VWF self-association, and in preventing that, it was an antithrombotic. And here's just a demonstration of one of the experiments. Uh, over here, you see that you can take a solution of von Willebrand factor, and you can vortex it. The vortexing adds shear stress to the molecules. Uh, and then you can measure how much VWF is left in the solution and how much goes on the wall. Um, and you can see here that if you do this for 90 minutes, there's basically no VWF left uh, in this uh, solution. But as you increase the concentration of uh, HDL, you can see that you get protection of the uh, VWF in the solution and it remains in there. And so we've looked at this in a number of ways, including those microvessels that I told you about, and in this a little microfluidic device that's patterned after a device described by Scott Diamond at University of Pennsylvania. And what it is is it's a channel that's 60 microns across, a long channel that whatever fluid you're studying is flowed through. And in the middle of that channel, there's a pillar that it that spans about half of the diameter of the entire channel. What that means for that pillar is that when the flow comes through that, it has to accelerate through there because all of a sudden it's a, like a stenosis. And so there's a lot of shear stress at the sides of that and there's flow acceleration through it. So if we take that, uh, you can see here that uh, just with um, plasma, so this is no longer VWF coming from the wall, this is just plasma, that the plasma VWF will bind to the pillar and self-associate into these long strands that uh, orient downstream from, from the pillar. If you take the same plasma and you add EDTA, EDTA inhibits the atom TS13 enzyme that cleaves von Willebrand factor, um, then um, you get much, much more VWF accumulation. And then um, if you take this, the conditions that you see in part B here and here, um, and you add HDL to about one and a half times the normal concentration in human plasma, you see that it's largely, pre the accumulation of VWF on those pillars is largely prevented. And just uh, to demonstrate again that this process is, um, is dependent on, well, is regulated by atom TS13, not dependent on it. You can see here that in the presence of this uh, inhibitory antibody, uh, P3A11, uh, the accumulation of VWF on those pillars is much more rapid and it accumulates to a much greater extent. Um, we also examine, of course, APO, uh, APOA1, or not APOA1, HDL is uh, composed of lipid and the apolipoprotein APOA1. Um, so we did an experiment. This is one of those tube experiments. And uh, in, when, in, under static conditions, you get almost no loss onto the wall of the VWF, no matter what's there. So we checked buffer. We checked uh, dimerist oil, phosphatidylcholine, APOA1, APOA1 but plus dimerist oil, phosphatidylcholine. Uh, if you just do this in buffer, you, you vortex it, so that's the shear stress. You lose most of the uh, VWF onto the wall. If you put the lipid in by itself, you get no difference. If you put in APOA1, just the apoprotein, uh, now you get protection. But if you put APOA1 in the presence of the lipid, it forms lipid nanodisks, 
and these are much more protective. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. There have been, over the years, uh, several peptides, APOA1 mimetic peptides, that have been developed for the purpose of being able to give APOA1-like activity orally. And uh, these are short peptides, about 18 uh, residues long, and they mimic APOA1. They don't have the same sequence, but they mimic APOA1 in that they have an amphipathic helix. And this one here is called L4F because it's L amino acids. And on one side of the helix, as depicted right over here, it has four phenylalanines. It's known that these can, can actually form nanodisks, much uh, like APOA1 with uh, lipids. And, uh, and they have been tested in a lot of things, and they've been shown to be anti-inflammatory, anti-atherogenic, uh, and, uh, and have a lot of activities similar to activities of HDL. So again, under static conditions, there's no loss. Uh, under shear, uh, without anything, you get, of course, loss. The lipid doesn't do anything again. The L4F actually starts to protect a little bit. But if you mix it so that it forms a nanodisc, uh, you get a substantial protection. So there's something about this mixture of this amphipathic protein and lipid that uh, prevents von Willebrand factor from self-associating. There's another form of HDL called fuse, acute phase HDL that is formed during acute inflammation. Uh, and that is known to be quite different than the normal HDL in your body. And one of the things is that the APOA1 in that uh, uh, particle is replaced by serum amyloid A1. Uh, and uh, that's, that's call, so that's called acute phase LDL. We tested this one, and you can see here that um, here's, again, loss uh, under, with nothing in there. If we add some of that acute phase HDL, uh, we get no protection and also at two different concentrations. But if we add uh, the, uh, the regular HDL, you get protection, and that's even in the presence of the acute phase LDL. So even though HDL is really good at protecting you from a lot of things, uh, when you have acute illness, you lose the protection because it goes away. Uh, and it's replaced by this stuff that's uh, not working. So there are a number of uh, lipoprotein particles in the plasma. Uh, there are, uh, there's HDL, the highest density one, that has a bunch of different subparticles that are different density. And then there are all of these, uh, the chylomicrons, uh, VLDL. So the ones that are synthesized in the lipid is VLDL, and that's uh, transformed into IDL, and then LDL and LDL as well has different uh, subfractions. Uh, the VLDL, IDL, and LDL all have apolipoprotein B100 in them. So what about the LDL? Since you know that LDL is bad cholesterol, HDL is good cholesterol, you want to know if <laughs> good and bad applies here too. Uh, well, if you take uh, uh, HDL and you look uh, and at uh, a fixed concentration, and you do the, the tube shear experiment, 80% uh, at uh, zero LDL concentration, 80% remains in the tube, and it progressively decreases as you increase the LDL concentration to, um, to the point that you have an LDL to HDL ratio of 7.33. If you double then the um, HDL concentration and you change the ratios in the same way, you, s you get essentially the same phenomenon. So it seems that it's the ratio of those two lipoproteins that it, what determines uh, whether VWF self-associates. And here we have uh, plasma uh, that in buffer, uh, it, and it, it's a measured uh, LDL to HDL of this. And if we add HDL, you get more protection. If we add LDL to this plasma, you get more loss of V of the VWF. So now I'm going to show you uh, plasma uh, that has had, it, it's either by itself, it's perfused through that microfluidic device by itself, or, um, oop, that didn't work. This is supposed to be a movie. No? 
And it's one of the most dramatic things that I have in my talk. <laughs> but it doesn't look like it's connecting. Well, suffice to say, let me just describe what was there. Oh, so like down here? Yeah, let's see. Okay, there we go. Thank you. All right, here's what we have. So on the left, you have just the plasma by itself. You see that you form these strands of VWF. In the middle, if you add HDL to about one and a half times the normal concentration, you completely protect. But if you do the other and you add LDL, so this is plasma, remember, not purified protein, you get these giant ugly things uh, that accumulate on those uh, pillars. And it seems that if you, uh, if you monitor this over time, you can see that the plasma in the middle, this, uh, this, uh, you get accumulation of the VWF on, the, on that pillar, and uh, HDL, in this case, completely prevents it. And uh, LDL, you get much faster accumulation initially and much larger total accumulation. And uh, here's another thing, yeah. So um, Kimsey Patton in our lab, he uh, decided to do a 3D reconstruction of this from purified plasma VWF to which had, it was just in buffer or in LDL. And you can see that there's much thicker strands and there's much more VWF accumulating in the presence of LDL. And of course, you want to see if there's a direct interaction between these. On the left side, you see that HDL, you have a much smaller uh, accumulation of VWF, and it's, and it's decorated somewhat with HDL. We assume that the HDL that binds to this is capping it and preventing self-association. On the right, you can see that there's a lot of binding of the LDL uh, to the VWF. So we've also looked at this fiber formation in hyperlipidemic plasma. And so uh, you can see that uh, here we have uh, patients from a lipid clinic that have a very high LDL cholesterol versus normal controls, but the patients and the controls have relatively equivalent levels of HDL. And you see down here that if we look at the initial rate of VWF accumulation on those, uh, on those pillars, that it pretty much correlates, except for one outlier, it correlates almost linearly with the ratio of LDL to HDL. Okay, so I told you already that there are many different uh, densities of lipoproteins, and so you have all of these here, LDL, IDL, uh, and LD, VLDL, IDL, and LDL, and those are all the ApoB100 containing lipoproteins. So if LDL can do it, what about these others? Uh, so here we have, and we see that if we look at LDL versus IDL and VLDL, that only LDL accelerates VWF self-association. Um, and if we take the LDL subfractions, which there are two, there's a uh, large buoyant fraction, that's the one that floats higher, and a small dense fraction. And it's only the small dense fraction, and this one is purported to be uh, more atherogenic. That's the only one that does this. We also looked at another lipoprotein that people are interested in, and that's LP, LP little a. That also has ApoB100, uh, but it has uh, apolipoprotein little a, which is a big Kringle domaining protein, uh, and that doesn't do anything. And we've also looked at uh, oxidized LDL, and that doesn't seem to change anything. So it's this small, dense LDL. So we've also looked at uh, what are the functional consequences? And we've done this with our uh, close collaborator, Jonathan Lindner. Uh, and he does this contrast uh, enhanced molecular imaging, uh, ultrasound molecular imaging. And basically, the contrast is provided by uh, these gas filled bubbles that are functionalized on the surface with molecules. And in this case, we functionalize it with GP1B alpha, which will detect the VWF. And we functionalize it with a piece of VWF, which will detect platelets. And so looking at uh, mice, uh, so we have ADAMTS13 deficient mice, and we're looking at whether uh, 
we can find signal on the blood vessels in the heart. And you see, the, and these are the microvasculature. You see it when, here's with saline. Here's if we inject with LDL, it seems like we get more signal. This injection had its problems. But um, if we put in uh, VWF, you get much more. And if we put them together, we get even more. The same if we take ADMTS13 knockout crossed with uh, LDL receptor. Um, you find that if you add VWF to those that you get more of this uh, VWF signal and you get exactly the same parallel in platelet signals. So the more, the, in the presence of VWF and LDL, you get more platelets, and you get more VWF on the small blood vessels and you get more platelets binding to it. And uh, some of the consequences of that is that you, your microvascular perfusion suffers and this you see here as the microvascular vascular perfusion goes down, and it's uh, lower if in VWF-injected uh, LDL receptor ADMTS13 knockout mice. And we see a trend here for um, a loss of this global longitudinal strength, which is, um, which is actually the ability of the myocardium uh, to squeeze down, so to eject blood from the left ventricle. Uh, this should be more negative, if that's good, and less negative if it's bad, and in both cases, it became less negative. So uh, recently, our uh, colleague, Dr. Adley, and uh, you heard from Nicole, they've uh, helped us with intravital microscopy. In this case, we look at ADMTS13 deficient uh, mice that, uh, that are, they, this is a um, mesenteric vessel that's treated with uh, calcium ionophore. Uh, to see what happens with um, platelet thrombi. And let's see if I can do this. And you'll see kind of a flash when the ionophore goes on. And then you see uh, here that there's a lot of platelet thrombi formation. Approximately 5% of all the platelets are labeled with fluorescence marker. The HDL treated one is on the bottom, and you see that you don't see very many large thrombi, whereas in the top, you see a lot of them. Uh, the other thing that I can tell you is that those uh, thrombi that are for, uh, formed at the bottom are, are smaller, and they don't persist so long. So that's what we get there. And, and so here's just a quantification. So here's the fluorescence uh, for platelets, and you see that in the Adam TS13 knockout mouse, you get a high fluorescence, and there's a lot of uh, platelet thrombi forming on the endothelium, and that goes on for a long time, and it gets back to about the baseline uh, at about eight minutes. Uh, the HDL treated, you got an initial rise that went down, and then these two lines join. If you look at the number of large thrombi, uh, there are much more, or m I should say there are much, there are much fewer in the HDL pretreated um, animals. And similarly, the time to thrombus resolution is much, much shorter. Now, if we look at the effect of LDL, now we're not looking at ADMTS13 deficient mice anymore. We're looking at wild type mice because we were afraid that the, that if we do get what we expect that the that the effect will be too severe. So here are YL type versus LDL treated YL type. LDL on the bottom. And there you can see that it's been activated. And uh, the LDL on the bottom, there are mu many more. And you know, in fact, these would be completely green if all of the platelets were labeled. So it's not just small. And you can see that they, there, there are kind of rolling thrombi that seem to kind of embolize off and go downstream, but they continue to form for a very long time. And this is in animals that have been uh, pre-injected with uh, LDL before the experiment was done versus pre-injected with saline at the top. And so uh, this, I can uh, let this go for a long time and the effect in the LDL pretreated mice persists for longer than in Adam TS13 knockout mice, which is kind of stunning to us. Okay, so here's the quantification. Again, here's in the LPL, LDL 
pretreated, you get a lot of fluorescence. And unlike in the Atom TS-13, even after 16 minutes, this has not returned to baseline. So there's something about LDL that really favors uh, the formation of these uh, VWF-dependent thrombi. Um, and and that, that uh, phenomenon persists for a long time. And I have to tell you that in this, this is a wild-type mouse, so there is no inhibition, and we've showed that the LDL does not inhibit the cleavage of VWF. And again, now we have many more large thrombi than in the control, and the time to resolution, as I already mentioned, is markedly prolonged. So I just wanted to highlight one uh, study that we've already published, and I've already talked about uh, at uh, UBC virtually. And this is a, a study with uh, Jonathan Lindner on the effects of this drug ponatinib uh, on uh, microvascular perfusion in the heart. So ponatinib is an, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's used in cry, chronic myelogenous leukemia uh, to treat the, the leukemia. But it's noticed that it has a lot of cardiovascular side effects, and those have to do with um, myocardial infarction and other myocardial ischemia, I should say. So uh, this is a, an experiment with panatinib in mice, and uh, these mice are made hyperlipidemic, so that's kind of, uh, you know, biasing the, <laughs> biasing the experiment. Uh, at least we think that that's going to bias it towards uh, uh, thrombosis or th 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 microvascular dysfunction. So if you, and these mice are treated with panatinib for a week. So if you look at the platelet uh, GP1B alpha signal, this is de uh, de oh, platelet GP1B alpha particles. These are detecting VWF. It's way higher in panatinib. Uh, the platelets are way higher, and there's nothing in control. Now, you can remove VWF from a surface in, in at least two ways. One is with the enzyme atom TS13. The other is with n cysteine which removes it by a disulfide reduction mechanism. Uh, both of these decreased the platelet signal and the VWF signal uh, on the surface. And here you see, here's, a, here's an ultrasound, an echocardiogram, and this has an akinetic region at the apex here. And if you compare the normal mice, and this is perfusion, so green would be good perfusion, the mice that are being treated have these microvascular perfusion defects, and you can see them down here, you can see them here. Whoa. Um, and here are some. And the final one is an angiogram of the heart to show that those perfusion defects are not the result of occlusion of large vessels. They are all microvascular defects. So we think that this process is actually quite important in a lot of pathologies. So to summarize, uh, the ability of surface-bound VWF to capture platelets depends on its ability to self-associate into thicker fibers and strands. This self-association increases as shear stress increases and with elongational flow or flow acceleration. Uh, and it increases the ability of VWF to bind platelets. The HDL will inhibit VWF self-association and decrease thrombus formation. And this effect is mimicked uh, somewhat by an APOA1 mimetic peptide. And acute phase HDL is ineffective in carrying this out. And LDL, on the other hand, promotes VWF self-association and thrombosis. And that activity seems to reside in the small, dense LDL fraction. And the effect of the lipoproteins on VWF depends on the ratio of their concentrations. And it seems that this endothelial bound VWF involved in multiple important human pathologies, including ponatinib associated microangiopathy, atherosclerosis, and aortic stenosis. I didn't show you the last two, but we have substantial data for athro and also aortic stenosis. So I just want to acknowledge uh, people who did the work or helped to do the work. Uh, and of course, my longtime colleagues, Dominic Chung and Junmei Chen, are vital to everything that happens in my lab. 
Uh, and a number of people that worked in there, uh, especially Kim Zee Platten, who developed uh, the microfluidic device, uh, Jing Fei Dong. Um, well, I don't really work that much with him before, but this all started in, uh, in our collaboration. Um, and at the University of Washington, there are several groups that have helped us. And of course, no longer at Oregon Health and Sciences University, now at University of Virginia, Jonathan Lindner and his lab. And with the hyperlipidemic plasma, we were helped out by Natalie Pamir and Sergio Fazio, also of OHSU. And I think I have time for questions. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I put this background here because it's a picture that I took when I went fishing uh, like 11 years ago with Ed Prysdale. And it's a picture of a maple leaf. So I'm in Canada and I wanted to honor you guys. <laughs> Thanks, Jose. That was fabulous. Um, I, I forgot to point out that he's actually a, 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 um, an amazing photographer as well. Um, I had a, a, a couple of questions. The LDL, the effect, is fair, unbelievable, and it's, it's believable, but, but it, those are on unperturbed endothelial cells, right? Is that right? No, they are activated. They are activated. They're activated. Okay, fine. Uh, that but I, I have to tell you about something um, that um, two, two studies. There's a study that you can look up from 1954 uh, done by a guy named Roy Swank, he, who was a neurologist studying multiple sclerosis. And he had this idea that there was something about lipid that perturbed brain blood flow and that made. Uh, MS worse because he noted that in all the that in northern climates and all the places where they didn't eat as many vegetables and they ate a lot more meat that it seemed that the incidence and the severity of multiple sclerosis was worse. So he did this study with um, hamsters and he looked at so intravital microscopy in the cheek pouch and he fed them fat for a couple of weeks and then he fed them a a high fat meal and then he just observed the microvascular circulation and it was stunning how defective it became everything sludged down at the peak of the lipid <laughs> that you had a number of small blood vessels that were occluded and he even describes these viscous strands that appear to be attaching the red blood cells to each other which i thought that's vwf so that's one there's another study by uh, Jonathan and Sergio at OHSU where they did plasmapheresis of patients with uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, so very high LDL levels. And then they, um, they did a, you know, plasmapheresis and then they checked their microvascular perfusion in the heart. And it became much better when they dropped the LDL. So I think that that self-association is happening with the fluid phase VWF and that probably kind of mucks up the small blood vessel somewhat. But in the, the experiments that I showed, we're activating the endothelium, so it's secreting a lot more. Let me ask one more question, Luke, okay? So in carotid artery stenosis, do you ascribe with, with emboli, do you, do you just ascribe that to this phenomenon of von Willebrand factor? Well, uh, I can't tell you for sure, but I don't know if you knew Alex Clues. Uh, he was a f kind of famous vascular biologist at University of Washington. Uh, he's since passed away. But when I uh, talked with him and I told him all about her, this is, was early on in the, the VWF strings and all of that. And he told me, I see those. <laughs> he said, I see them in the carotids. I see these things that look like shaggy things that are hanging off over there. And uh, he, he thought that that's what they were. I don't know if they are, but I, th I think probably yes. Yeah, I think we should use an acetylcysteine or something to get the VWF off of there. Uh, so, Dr. Lopez, thank you. That was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed the videos. I'm glad they worked. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Uh, the first is, it seems like the hot topic in clinical cardiology these days is why women have more microvascular angina um, than men. And I, with all the slides you show, I wonder if you've had opportunity to look at sex-specific differences in microvascular disease as it pertains to von Willebrand antigen. Um, and my second question is a little bit out there, so maybe it's just a quick yes or no, but um, 
the, one of the emerging therapies, antithrombotic therapies, is factor 11A inhibition with things like milvexian. And in the textbooks, you know, it says that von Willebrand is really only involved in platelet aggregation and protecting factor 8. But I'm wondering if there's any uh, interaction with factor 11 that might pertain to these new uh, pharmacologic agents. Well, uh, that's not such an out there question because uh, one phenomenon that we've observed that I didn't have time to show was that under the right conditions, and this is, we've only demonstrated this in vitro, those VWF strands nucleate shear dependent uh, fibrin formation that is dependent on uh, contact pathway activation uh, so that, in fact, Factor 11 would be, uh, would be involved in that, and it may help. And you think those are scary looking. Th those other things will go on. And as far as I know, that's really the only example of the formation of fibrin under very high shear stresses. Uh, and the first one was about the, the women and uh, well, microvascular angina. We haven't done anything on that. Uh, thanks for the suggestion. But we do think that what we're seeing here is a phenomenon that relates to, there, there's this phenomenon the cardiologists called no reflow, where you open up a big vessel, but the small vessels are completely still, done. there's no flow in there. And that gets, that's much worse if the LDL is higher. So I think it's probably related to that. So you started off uh, with uh, buffer and Adam's TS-13 being very important. Then you took us into a frightening world of lipids. I'm not going to measure mine. Uh, <laughs> is there any correlation between Adam's TS-13 levels and atherosclerosis? Because that was part and part of your initial package. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not sure if there is, but there is uh, evidence in mice, the, uh, and we have some evidence as well, that the Adam TS13 knockout made hyperlipidemic develop athro much more rapidly, and the the extent of atherosclerosis is greater. I have a question. Um, oh, sorry, I don't think. Um, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Um, I was wondering if you could speculate a little bit more on the mechanism of LDL's effects. Um, directly on the Van Vilbrandt um, factor association. So I noted in one of your images in the flow chamber, you showed um, HDL in red and some level of binding, and you thought that might be indicating capping. And in the, the LDL picture in green, there was a lot of LDL binding, and I was just wondering what your, your thoughts are on that mechanism versus the HDL. Yeah, we're doing two things on that. Uh, we ha Okay, we have first, our first idea is that LDL binds to a region that unfolds the A2 domain. That's the domain that unfolds that allows Adam TS13 to cut. If that speeds up the unfolding of that domain, then you could, it can bind itself, basically, in another strand. Uh, we're also doing a bunch of uh, protein folding and docking uh, simulations with uh, artificial intelligence, and we have found what looks like potential binding sites in other regions of the uh, VWF for uh, APOA1. And it, it has something to do with a very peculiar confirmation of, we think it's in APOB, pretty much. Uh, one of the confirmations that really depends on the density of the particle or exposure of something. Um, so uh, we don't know yet, but we're working on that. Thanks. Hello. Um, quick question. Thank you for a fantastic talk, and you really show what, uh, that an image is worth a thousand words or a thousand graphs. Um, my question is following a little bit on the previous one about sex. <laughs> Being a woman and getting to the age where this will really matter. Um, it's common in experimental design that people will use male mice and even in plasma experiments will use male plasma. And, and I was wondering if you, uh, have a, if you do that or if you uh, pay attention to have equal representation of both sexes. And, and one of the things that led me to this is a, I was reading a recent, recent work in CNN admittedly, but it was showing that good cholesterol is protective uh, for cardiovascular disease in white people, but not in black people. 
And, and, and those are things that people working at the bench don't tend to consider in their study design. I just wanted you to comment on that. Well, I think it's a good comment. Um, and probably we have not paid as much attention as we should in the animal models uh, for the for the patient studies, uh, there was no bias that I know of, of male versus female. It, the bias was all whether they have hypercholesterolemia where we can have a high LDL. But I think that's an excellent question. And of course, there are many, many other factors. Uh, for example, so far we have found only one natural substance that can inhibit the self-association, but there are other substances in plasma that uh, promote it, and one of those is platelet factor four. So in, in HIT, it seems to be a thing. Um, and so if, as those vary with gender or with different ethnic groups, or probably, I would say, more with environment, like diet, <laughs> you're going to get a lot of uh, differences. And of course, the presence or not of um, inflammatory conditions and things like that. So I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, and uh, we need to pay attention. <laughs> One of them is from Dr. Kresh. How do you envision that HDL and LDL antagonize each other in VWF self-association? Oh, an another good question. Thank you, Krish. Um, well, we didn't think that they were directly competing. Uh, but in our simulations, there is a region in the, that is not where we thought it was, that's uh, more internal to the A1 domain that the computer programs predict uh, they, that both of the particles bind to. They bind to it slightly different, so uh, we don't know. Uh, we still don't know. Uh, w the way we thought about it before was that LDL would increase the unfolding of VWF and that the, um, that the HDL would block the site uh, that self-associated. I think that's kind of still our working hypothesis until we get to test the predictions from the computers. Thanks for the question. Another question from Vlad, from Dr. Kirschlav. Very impressive data. Does VWF have HDL binding site? Uh, say again, please. Does VWF has HDL binding site? It does, uh, but we don't know where it is. <laughs> and the question from Dr. Prezdel. Fabulous talk, expect, as expected. In the VWF, under, undergoing limited protolysis in plasma when LDL versus HDL is available, possibly by plasmin? Can you repeat the last part? I'm sorry. Is the VWF undergoing limited protolysis in plasma when LDL versus HDL is available, possible by plasmin? Um. Well, that's a good question. I can't really answer it. it from our studies, it doesn't seem that, uh, at least with ADAMTS-13, that, that they affect uh, the proteolysis uh, of VWF that much. Although, w I'll say that if you accelerate self-association, there seems to be a competition between self-association and proteolysis. So if these strands self-associate, they're harder to cut. Um, uh, as to plasmin, that's a good question. I don't know, and probably something to investigate. Uh, similar question. Do you have a proposed mechanism for how HDL prevents this VWF association and stranding? Well, I kind of addressed that one uh, uh, a little bit. But yeah, so right now, we are working on the assumption that the HDL recognizes a hydrophobic region uh, that becomes exposed uh, af when shear stress unfolds the VWF. Uh, but uh, it may be something else. We, we're working on it.